Hi, welcome to our Sunday morning service. It is December the 19th, 2021, and it is the last Sunday uh, before Christmas. And if you are joining us this morning or able to join us live, this is the day we put our Christmas boxes together and we work with the elementary school here in town and they help to identify between 30 and 40 uh, families with children that are in the school that have a need this Christmas. And so if you can make it this morning, our live service is at 10 o'clock. After service, we'll be uh, delivering these uh, boxes of food and gifts and uh, the gospel to some of these families. So we encourage you to be part of that if you can. I do want to also remind you, we are, uh, we will, years ago, the tradition of having a Christmas day service started here. It happened years ago when Christmas happened to me on a Sunday. And uh, it was just a blessing to be here on a Christmas morning. So uh, this coming Saturday, Christmas day at 10 o'clock, we will be just a short um, day of, of gathering to sing some um, Christmas uh, hymns and to uh, uh, study some word and uh, just pray with one another and thank God for or sending a son to die for us. So that'll be Christmas morning at 10 o'clock. I'm sure that it will be uh, to come here at this time. There'll be no Sunday evening services, uh, either the 19th or the 26th. Um, so there will be, however, Wednesday, our regular Wednesday evening Bible service. We can also ladies' Bible study this week on Wednesday also. So lots happening at this time of year for everybody. So we just want to make um, available to you to anything you want to be a part of. Let's pray. We'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Uh, bless our just short, short study of your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Well, this is the last Sunday before Christmas. And over the years, traditionally, you know, uh, kind of pre COVID, we have a little choir number and sometimes a children's program. And I'm sure that will be. Uh, come back when the Lord deems it okay and uh, leads us to do that. But we do want to look at Christmas today. So um, let's look at Luke chapter two this morning. Um, and Christmas has been something that that coming of the birth of Christ, the coming of the Messiah. Um, to get a little background, it's something that that the Israelites in the world have been waiting for for 4,000 years. This all started with Adam in, in the Garden of Eden when he ate of that fruit. And Romans 5 teaches us that when the offense of one man because of the sin of Adam, sin has passed to every single human being. We are born dead in our trespasses and sin. The sin was inherited from Adam, according to Romans 5. And so when Adam sinned and, and God walked in the garden and looked for Adam and him and Eve were hiding and he looked at Adam and, and says, he asked him, how do you know you were naked? He says, well, it's a woman you gave me uh, caused an issue. God went to the woman and she said, well, it was the serpent that, that deceived me. And God went to the serpent. And as he looked at Satan, he uh, made a statement to him in Genesis 3.15. And this is really the first proclamation or prophecy or promise of God that he was going to send a savior. And he looked at this serpent in Genesis 3, verse 15. And he says, I will put an enmity or a wall or a separation between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Uh, we're told in Isaiah 53 that Christ was bruised uh, and, and for our iniquities, our sins. And we know that bruising came on the cross. He died on the cross. Uh, but when he rose from the dead, that was a crushing blow to Satan. So we know the whole story. We know the birth of Jesus in, in Bethlehem. And we know that he grew and uh, to be God in the flesh incarnate. And we know that he grew to be sinless because he was not 
human. He was God incarnate. And that savior of the world came, um, born of the seed of, of the Holy Spirit in a woman. And her seed or her child would be this Jesus. And so this was the promise of God all the way in Genesis, that Christmas was coming. And all along throughout the history of Israel, God gave further information and through Moses and uh, through Abraham, through David, and then through the prophets. In fact, Isaiah 7, 14 says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And so we get tremendous information thousands of years from Genesis 3.15. We get the information that this Savior would be a son to a virgin woman, a young woman. Uh, we know it to be Mary. But in Isaiah 7.14, we give, get some incredible information there about the coming of the Messiah. Isaiah further says in Isaiah 9.6, unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So in Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9, we have some incredible further information. It's going to be a child. It's going to be a son. It's going to be born of a virgin, and it's going to be a man. God with us. He's going to be mighty God. It says it right there. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, God with us. They had this information that this seed from Genesis 3 is going to be God himself in the form of a baby or a child born to a virgin. Incredible information. Micah 5 2 goes on to tell us that, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth from on, of old and from everlasting. So this has been known. This ruler of Israel, this savior, this mighty God, this wonderful counselor, this prince of peace, will be born of a virgin in the town of Bethlehem. Now, Christmas morning, um, we'll have the message about Bethlehem, and it'll be an uh, incredible um, kind of historical view of this little town of Bethlehem where Christ was born. Uh, but for today, we want to just talk about the seed, the Savior, the Son, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Emmanuel. And, uh, and, and we want to understand that God said in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now we know that this Word is Jesus. John 1.14 says, we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten one. So from before the foundations of the earth, this plan was set in order by God. And he would come in the form of his son. And it would be God with us. And when Jesus walked this earth, it was God walking this earth in an earthly human form in order to become sin for us and die on that cross. But to do that, he must be perfect. And to be perfect, he could not be born of the seed of Adam. So this virgin birth brought our Savior into the world, whose blood, the Bible says, is without spot. Without so finally, after 4,000 years of waiting since the promise was made, we end up in Luke chapter 2, in verse 8. After 4,000 years, of patriarchs, of judges, of kings, of prophets, of priests, 
of men of honor. The, the, the proclamation is made to shepherd. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 8. There were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. You look at Luke 2, verse 4. Joseph has to go up out of Nazareth to Bethlehem. And there's no room at the inn. And, and she brought forth this firstborn son in verse 7 and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And then the angels come to who? Shepherds. To all people. He didn't come to the kings, didn't come to the priests, didn't come to the prophets. The came to shepherds. Because that's what God does. You know, there's no greater inclusionary message in the message of the gospel. It doesn't separate us by age, finances, nationality, skin color, language. We're all in one nation, one blood in the eyes of God. And, and by the way, uh, we're all sinners. So you, whatever sin that we're involved with also doesn't eliminate us. Anybody who repents and turns from their wicked ways, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, say, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but of everlasting life. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin is death. The, the punishment or the consequences of Adam's sin is that we are all separate from God because God is holy in God. And he wants us to be with them, but there is only one way. The wages and payment for sin is death, so somebody had to make that payment for us. And the only one who could do that would be someone with no sin, and the only one with no sin would have to be God. So somehow God would have to become man while still being God. And only God could do that. And he did that by Christmas, by creating uh, the ability for Mary to carry the very son of God, the seed of the spirit of God. And when she bore that son in Luke 2, 7, it was the son of God. Now we had God with us, Emmanuel, and they were to call his name Jesus. Christ, the Messiah, the chosen one, the holy one. I know it sounds like every little fantasy fairy tale you've ever read about the chosen one, but all those fantasies are simply taken uh, from the true story of Jesus Christ. And now it was time for God to announce to the world that after 4,000 years, he's kept his promise and he goes to shepherds, keeping watch over their flock by night. Verse 11, Luke chapter 2, there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. See, this is towards us. This is God's goodwill, God's sovereign grace, God's mercy on the world by sending his only son, born of that virgin, that would be there to die for our sins. And the heavenly host praises his name and imagine these shepherds looking at that son. And God goes to the lowly, God goes to the least, little as much when God is in it for a blessing. And they go and they lead us to Bethlehem where they see the baby. And the promise is finally kept. 
we saw that promise. The Bible says in John 1, 14, I read it to you already, that the word became flesh. Remember, John 1, 1, the word was with God and the word was God. God in the flesh, just as Isaiah had prophesied. It is Emmanuel. And we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We, we've also beheld him. Turn, if you will, to verse 25 of Luke chapter 2. There's two incredible people in this book. As God, from the time of his birth, begins to reveal himself to those who God chooses to reveal himself, the shepherds. And now, a man named Simeon, verse 25, says, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this was a just and devout man waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. This is amazing. Verse 26, it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. 4,000 years they've been waiting for this moment. God keeping his promise of God taking care of this, this burden of sin that was weighing on all of mankind. And up until this point, the only way was to offer types and pictures and signs of God through sheep and bullocks and, 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 and all kinds of different blood sacrifices, uh, tabernacles and temples, all shadows of, of Christ to come. Now there's this man who was told that he would not die before he saw the Christ. It would be like God coming to you and saying to you, you will not die without seeing the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we talk about end times and we talk about the Lord returning and, and I don't expect him to return in my lifetime. A thousand years is as a day. I'm getting old. My hair is gray and, and times are, are fleeing by quickly. Well, he might, but maybe someday I'll sit in my rocking chair and God will come to me and say, John, you will not die until you see the Lord return. What? I, I, I couldn't imagine even, even how to deal with that. It would be such an amazing blessing. And here is Simeon waiting, knowing that he's going to see the Savior they've been waiting for for 4,000 years. Verse 27 says, so he came by the spirit of to the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him, according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed him and blessed God and said, Lord, verse 29, you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Let me say that again. My eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. God brings it all together. See, the, the, the idea of Israelites being God's chosen people, chosen for what? You know, the Bible says that about Israel, in you all the nations would be blessed. But they're not blessed by the nation. They're blessed by the Savior who came from that Israelite nation who came from that Israelite nation that God had kept as, as Satan tried to destroy it for thousands of years. God kept that remnant until that nation. And God says through Simeon that this nation, the glory of Israel is Jesus and the salvation of the Jews is Jesus. See, as soon as he saw the baby, he knew. That's how it's going to be. Every knee's going to bow. Every tongue's going to confess we're all going to see that Savior someday. And I pray that you see him before it's too late. I pray that you would know him. You would behold his glory. That you would behold his grace and his truth. As Simeon did. That you would see the truth. I've met Jesus. Not seen him face to face. But 1979. It was revealed to me through the Holy Spirit that he was true. Through reading of his word, through hearing the gospel, I knew it. And everything changed. You can ask my family, some that don't even like it. Some that don't even appreciate that, that I've changed my life completely. 
I'm a different person. Thanks to Jesus. Verse 33, Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for a fall. Let me read that again. Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. The death of Christ, he's prophesying already. God gave Simeon this information that he saw the consolation, the salvation, but with that salvation comes the necessity to die. And Mary's own soul will be pierced just as Christ. By the spear in his side, by the nails in his hands. Verse 36 introduces us to a woman named Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of uh, Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and lived with her husband seven years and her virginity from her virginity. And the woman was widow of about 84 years. She's very elderly, married for 70 years, seven years, and widow for the rest of her time. And she did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. I want you to think about Simeon. And now I want you to think about Anna. Anna walks in. She has been praying and fasting and serving God for over 80 years. And she walks in and she recognizes that this is the Savior. This is the salvation of the Lord. And from that moment that she saw him, what does she do? She gives thanks to the Lord, which is what we're celebrating. We ought to be giving thanks to the Lord. For sending his son to die for us. But look what she does next. Verse 38. She spoke of them to all who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. All those who looked for the forgiveness of sins. That's all we're doing here. You don't want anything to do with Jesus. Well, then you don't even really have a Christmas. There's nothing to celebrate without Jesus Christ. It's just a winter festival. And it means really nothing. Go Enjoy your life because it's going to be pretty bleak when it's over. If you choose to ignore this Emmanuel, this Prince of Peace, this mighty God, this everlasting Father, this salvation of all peoples, and this revelation and light to the Gentiles, if you ignore him, you have nothing to celebrate. But if you rejoice in him, and we pray that God would open your eyes as he did Anna and Simeon and these shepherds. And that you would see that Christ child as God in the flesh. And then you would be like Anna. And you would just tell all those. And that's what we're supposed to do. Follow in the footsteps of Anna, which is to serve daily. Praising God. Praying for God, fasting when he calls us to, and most importantly, telling all those who look for redemption. Let's close with Titus chapter 2, and we'll see that our challenge from God in 2021 is no different than Anna's 2,000 years ago. The Bible says in Titus 2.11, that for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That is Jesus. He's appeared to men. He walked on this earth. He did miracles. He spoke uh, the word of God. And then he died on the cross. And then he did the greatest act of all, which is rising from the dead. And we, Paul, writing this, speaking to Titus, look at, it's appeared to all men. This, this 4,000 year wait was over. Teaching us that denying ungodliness in worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. So we follow the, the example of Anna and Simeon. 
when they saw this, this wonderful counselor, this mighty God, they began to live for that God. Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous of good works. So now we're in a similar spot. We're not looking for the coming Messiah, as some in this world do. We are not ignoring that there is not going to be a Messiah, as some people do. We know that God kept his promise of Genesis 3.15, and he kept it in Luke chapter 2, 2,000 years ago, when he sent his only begotten son, born of a virgin. That's why we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate this promise of God, but we also, with, with the celebration of, of, of God keeping his promise, we also re rely and look forward to the return of Christ, who when he died, he rose again, ascended into heaven and said, I will come in like manner until I do be witnesses to me, to the ends of the earth. And so we look for the blessed hope and we look for Jesus Christ. And, and he, when he comes, he's not going to come to kings and priests and pastors. He's going to come to shepherds. He's going to come to those who are home. Look at verse 15. We'll close with this. Speak these things. Exhort, rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. We have the authority of the word of God to speak these truths. And these truths are that man sinned in the garden. God promised to send a seed that would take care of that sin. And that seed would be God with us. And that seed would be born of a virgin. And that would be God and be born in Bethlehem. And we celebrate the promise kept every Christmas. We think about how God kept that promise. And then we look forward to Jesus returning and making all things right and throwing sin once and for all in the lake of fire. And yet, our job until that is the same as Anna, to speak these things to those who are looking for redemption. To those who are not looking for redemption, deep in your heart, deep in that inner person, you know you need it. You know that God is real. We know that you want to revel in, in, in your life and in other things and in yourself. But, but just, just think during this time of Christmas, could this possibly be true? The Bible tells us in Titus 2.15 that I have all authority by this book to rebuke and encourage, to encourage you to turn your life to Jesus Christ and to rebuke this world for its rejection of the most amazing moment in the history of mankind when God himself, born in that manger, Walk this earth, God. Please go to God. Ask, just say, God, is this old man right? Is this true? Read the word. Read Luke chapter two. Read John chapter three. Read John chapter one. Just read them. You can read it anywhere with our phones and everything. It's, it's accessible to everyone. Just go. What a time we live. To just go to the word of God. That'll change your life. Give them a chance. Spend this Christmas at least searching Christ. Do your due diligence and, and see what God does with those words. I encourage you to do so. For those of you who know Jesus, Praise the Lord. Go celebrate. Send presents to one another. Decorate your house. Rejoice in this knowledge that the salvation of God has come and he's coming back. And until he does, we got to speak these things. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and for your salvation. And Lord, let us celebrate this Christmas because there's so much to be thankful for and rejoice in. You who keep your promises, 
Lord, help us to lean on you. As it's getting harder and harder to speak these things, but let us be bolder and bolder. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a great Christmas. I hope to see you soon.